a very good afternoon once again. Romans and chapter 7, the book of Romans and chapter 7. We'll pick it up from verse 21. Uh, the Bible reads, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself save the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I save the law of sin. Chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own son in the likeness of sin for flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We are in chapter 8. It was necessary that we read uh, part of chapter 7 because as we enter chapter 8, the Apostle Paul is coming from chapter 7 where he is coming from an intense conflict with indwelling sin in Romans chapter 7. He makes a triumphant de declaration which started from Romans chapter 7 and 25a and continues into chapter 8 where he outlines, excuse me, the basis for Christian victory. The Christian life, the apostle shows us, is a conflict, it's a struggle, it's battle consisting of two warring parties. From chapter 7 into chapter 8, the enemy is identified. This enemy is ruthless and powerful. In chapter 8, the apostle shows how the victory against this enemy can be attained through the operation of God, the Holy Spirit. And so identifying and understanding the nature of the two warring parties, one referred to as the law of sin and death, and the other referred to as the law of the spirit operating within the believer is thus crucial. And that is what will preoccupy us in this session. That the Christian life is a life of conflict or warfare needs to be stressed or emphasized, especially to the young believer. Oftentimes the picture we paint is that becoming a Christian is the beginning of an easy life where life's challenges are easily overcome. And so the young believer expects health and wealth, straightforward relationships and marriage, employment and business. Then they begin to face fierce conflict and then they begin to wonder what has gone wrong with their Christian life. All of a sudden, everything seems to be a struggle no one told them that the Christian life is a fight. 
First Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about, about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And so, verse 1 of chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, is first a continuation of the theme of justification by faith, which our brother Nico has shown, has been taking us through, already covered earlier on, but it's, it's part of that theme. Because condemnation, the word condemnation is, is, just the word, is just the opposite of justification. But what follows in chapter 8 highlights now the process of sanctification. Uh, the process of sanctification. So we might ask the question, how does the life of a justified person look like in real time? And the Apostle Paul answers us, starting from chapter 7, that it looks like a battlefield. Whereas, uh, if we were to picture a justified believer, positionally, they are seated with Christ, dressed in pure white, in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, positionally, they are with Christ, seated with Christ, dressed in white. In real time here on earth, they are covered in mud on the battlefield. And bullets are flying and bombs are, you know, like when you switch on uh, these days television to uh, either, either Ukraine or, or, or Israel, Gaza. It's just bombs and bombs and bombs. That is how the Christian life looks like in real time. And so the, the Apostle Paul is trying to show us that we need to fight this fight in real time. And we need to identify the enemy. The enemy is ruthless. And in order to have victory, we need to understand what is happening in our lives. So he begins by saying in verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In which way is there no condemnation? Not in a general sense. The believer can be condemned by their own conscience, for example, when they do wrong. First John chapter 3, reading from verse 19. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. And this self-condemnation is very evident when we read Romans chapter 7. Uh, for those of us who are pastors, one possible cause of lack of assurance in young believers and in, even in older believers perhaps who have fallen in some sin and now they are no longer sure where they stand, one possible cause is the failure to understand this fight we are talking about this afternoon. But furthermore, that's, we've talked about self-condemnation. So it's not in that sense that the apostle is saying there's no condemnation. Uh, the believer can be condemned by other human beings, by fellow human beings, whether wrongly or rightly, but they can be condemned by fellow human beings. As we see in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, uh, the apostle Paul says, when Cephas uh, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. So he was con uh, Peter was condemned by Paul, uh, rightly so, because of his behavior. So we can be condemned by fellow human beings, or we can experience self-condemnation. So this is not what the apostle is talking about. Rather, what is being addressed here is a legal condemnation from God's judgment throne. As we have already seen, when God justifies the sinner, he treats them just as if they've never sinned because they are clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 3, reading from verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. How come condemnation is removed from those who are in Christ? And how is the law of the Spirit? How does the law of the Spirit set free from the law of sin and death? Let us move on to verse 2 of uh, Romans chapter 8. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So we say this is what will preoccupy us, just identifying these two opposing laws. What is this law of sin and death that the Apostle Paul considers to be the deadly enemy? Let us begin with God's law itself. In the beginning, God gave the law to his people, the Israelites, through his servant Moses. The moral law that is summarized in the Ten Commandments and God's law, once given, places a demand on human beings. The law is never neutral. So it is not given and then we can do whatever we like with it. When a law is given, uh, even, even in the land, when, when, uh, whether it's traffic laws, when a law is given, it is a demand on us. It is do it or else. So that's a demand. You cannot just say, I don't feel like. The law, any law that is given, places a demand on us. More so God's law places a demand on human beings. The righteous requirement or demand of the law is clearly indicated in such passages of scripture as Leviticus chapter 19. I'm going to read from verse 18. It says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. But already notice the words, you shall. That's a demand. You shall not. You shall not. Uh, uh, then it goes on to say, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall, there we are again, a demand. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Micah summarizes the law's requirements in the following manner. Micah, Micah chapter 6 verse 8 says, He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you or demand of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God, that is the demand that, that God places upon us. Coming to the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ confirms the demands found in the law of Moses in Matthew 22, reading from verse 35. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The Ten Commandments are summarized in these two commandments. So how do I know if, if I'm keeping God's commandments? We must just test ourselves against these two commandments. Am I loving God with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind? And secondly, am I loving my neighbor as I love myself? If I am uh, the, uh, obeying these two commandments, I don't even need even to go through all the ten. I'm obeying the whole law. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ says. I'm fulfilling the whole law if, if I can love God with my all and love my neighbor as as myself, all the law is fulfilled, no problem. So what is the righteous requirement of the law that the apostle talks about in verse 4? Let's read verse 4. In order that the, require, the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. How 
is the right, righteous requirement of the law fulfilled in us? How is it to be fulfilled in us? Well, the law demanded, or rather God demanded, that his law, firstly, must be obeyed in spirit or in truth from the heart. John chapter 4 verse 24 tells us God is, is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. In the Sermon on the Mount, which runs from Matthew chapter 5 up to Matthew chapter 7, the Lord Jesus Christ shows us that obeying the law of God goes beyond keeping the letter of the law. It goes beyond physical or outward obedience. He brings out the spirit or the heart of the law which God is looking for. Let's just take two examples from the Sermon on the Mount. First, he picks the commandment, thou shalt, thou shalt not murder, Matthew 5, 21 to 22. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. So the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, you have not obeyed the commandment not to kill if you hate your brother, even if this hatred might reside deep down your heart. A secret hatred or grudge against a neighbor is murderous in nature because from it springs murderous action. If we're, if we're to do an exercise and I ask the question, how many of us have killed a person? Uh, and then we say, come to the front, like real killing a person. I don't know how many would come to the front. Most likely, <laughs> most likely no one. Even those who have done wouldn't want to come to the front. Yeah. Now imagine we, we change the parameters. We said, if you have been angry with someone in a bad way, obviously the, there is anger which is righteous. Now in a sinful, in a bad way, you, you, you have really been angry as to wish harm to someone. So if we did the same exercise to say, come to the front, more likely, if we're to be honest, there would be more people coming to the front who have not physically murdered a person, but have been angry in a bad way with a fellow human being. And this is what the Lord Jesus Christ is bringing forward. It is on account of the seriousness of this matter that the Lord Jesus Christ goes on to teach that if there is serious conflict, between you and your brother, first go and sort things out before you proceed with your worship. This is recorded in Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So serious is the matter of sorting out differences that Christ says, no, don't go on as if it's business as usual when you know that there is conflict, serious conflict. And the reconciliation, uh, when it comes to, to that, or forgiving of the other person, Christ goes on to show, must be from the heart. Matthew 18, verse 35 so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Uh, unfortunately, in our churches, many who claim to have forgiven someone who offended them have not done so from their heart. They might have developed a cold or cool attitude towards them, they do not relate with them as they used to before, but they say they've forgiven them. It's, it's clear it's not from the heart. Perhaps they even gossip and slander them behind their backs. Perhaps they even secretly rejoice when something bad happens to that person. It is clear it is not forgiveness from the heart. 
So in our churches, uh, those of us who are leaders, we must help the people who have differed, not only to reconcile, as Paul does in the case of these two women in Philippians chapter 4, Eudia and Sintika, but we must encourage them and teach them to forgive each other from the heart. Because an unforgiving spirit can easily become murderous in nature. So we are seeing that the obeying of the command should be in spirit and in truth, not just outwardly. That is example number one. Example number two is, thou shalt not commit adultery. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so we can do that same exercise and ask how many have committed adultery as in physically and come to the front. I'm sure no one will, but nonetheless. Then we say how many, especially the men, how many have looked lustfully? I'm sure the space might be a bit small. <laughs> so the crowd increases, immediately it becomes a hard issue. The crowd increases, the crowd, the people who are breaking the, the same commandment, by the way, when it becomes a hard issue, they are more who have broken that commandment. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, you have not obeyed the commandment not to commit adultery if in your heart you are harboring lust. And it is on account of the seriousness of, of the sin of lusting that Christ goes on to teach that anything that leads to lust in the heart must be plucked out. And so what we read, what we watch, what we see, if it causes lust, it is lust that God wants uprooted from our lives. Not, 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 not just behaving well outwardly, but the root of the problem must be uprooted. So it must be plucked out in the same way he says you'd pluck out an eye. Similarly, the same command to sort out lust in the community of believers, we're talking about the community of believers here, not the world at, out there, Anything that leads others to the sin of lust must be plucked out. Now, we are living at a time when the issue of things like indecent dressing is being taken very lightly, not only by the world, but by the church as well. But the truth of the matter is the older women in the church have got a God-given responsibility to train the younger women in the church to dress appropriately, according to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 9, because the Lord Jesus Christ has got this to say about causing others to sin. Matthew 18, 6 to 7 says, But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. Uh, allow me to narrate a real life story from Zambia where a young people's fellowship, where the young people meet for fellowship, the boys and girls, and they, they have a matron and a patron attached to them like a husband and a wife. So one day the boys, just after the meeting, just came straight to the matron, that is the, the, the lady in charge of the wife. So they said, auntie, please help us. Tell the girls when to dress properly when they come for the young people's fellowship. As we go to the young people's fellowship to worship God, but they themselves come as if they're coming for a fashion parade. Help us. Deliver us from temptation. So all the women have got a responsibility to assist the younger women concerning this matter, because God takes very seriously the sin of lust. That's, 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 that's the, 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 the point here. So uh, let's move on. So why the spirit of the law 
uh, in human relations. Romans 13 verse 8 says, Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So God does not want us just to behave nicely towards each other. God, uh, and uh, just by avoiding uh, offensive behavior, but he wants us to positively love each other. And the two, are comp the two things are completely different. So, what is, so that was under the law must be obeyed from the heart or in spirit and truth. But secondly, the law must be obeyed perfectly. Deuteronomy 27, 26, Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say, Amen. And James chapter 2, verse 10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit, ad if you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Romans 10, 5, uh, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. If the law is to give life, this must be fulfilled. It must be obeyed 100%. The law, as given by God, was good and perfect, is good and perfect. The law is a perfect representation of God's holy character. But how come the Apostle Paul, and we are still trying to identify this law of sin and death, how come the apostle refers to it as the law of sin and death? Romans, in Romans 7 verse 7, he confirms that the law is very good. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting, coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. Romans 7 12. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Verse 3 tells us that this same good law was weakened by the sinful nature. Uh, let's, let's read verse 3. I hope it's verse 3 I'm reading. Sorry, I've got challenges with my eyes in the absence of light. Um, uh, okay, I think it is. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. So the law was weakened by the sinful flesh. How was it weakened? Genesis 2, 16 to 17, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And we know how Adam responded to this command. In disobedience, he ate. In disobedience, he ate. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. So in disobedience, Adam ate. And we know the what, what were the consequences. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. We all know the story. Adam did not drop dead after he ate the forbidden fruit. But that same day, as God promised he would, he died. The death was a spiritual death, obviously. Far much more serious than physical death. And some of the serious consequences of Adam's sin included inability to perfectly obey the law of God. Romans chapter 8, uh, reading from verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Inability to please God. At best, man's obedience to God's law was trying to conform to the written code, merely outward. This fell far short of God's perfect standard. And when many Jews concluded that they were keeping the commandments perfectly, 
this is what they had in mind. For example, the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19, reading from verse 16. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still like? Now, what follows? The answer that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to him was actually meant, tailored to show him that he had not kept a single commandment. And that's why he went away sad. It was tailored, the Lord Jesus Christ showed him that he had not kept a single com commandment at all to, by, uh, to God's satisfaction. But in Romans chapter 7, a spiritually awakened Paul now realizes that God's standard is infinitely too high for any human being to satisfy. He also realizes that God's law is serving another function. That instead of bringing life, it is exposing his sinfulness. And when sinfulness is exposed, instead of imparting life, the law brings death. Uh, chapter 7, 9 to 10. He says, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. And so two challenges arose from Paul's interaction with the law. First, it exposed his sin and this led to death. The soul who sins shall die, Ezekiel 18, 20. Hence, Paul referring to it as the law of sin and death. What was God's solution? We enter the other law, the law of the spirit. What was God's solution to all this? Romans 8, chapter 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sin for flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order to deliver the sinner from the law of sin and death, God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, this referring to the incarnation. God the son became man, human in every sense except for sin. Hebrews 7.26 tells us, for it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, and stand, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. It goes on to say he condemned sin in the flesh. He punished his son treating him as if he was the condemned sinner. Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Now Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ has ascended. How does this become reality in real time in our lives? Enter God the Holy Spirit. God sends the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.2 talks of the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And so the Holy Spirit comes to apply the law of the spirit of life. Firstly, why is he called the spirit of life? Because he is life-giving. He is the life-giving spirit. He imparts life both physical and spiritual as can be seen from John chapter 6, uh, six verse 63, it says the spirit who gives life, uh, rather it is the spirit who gives life, the flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, 
not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. There we are. Again, the spirit of life. He gives life. He gives life in regeneration. He brings forth spiritual children. He imparts life dead to dead sinners. This, this was that whole discussion between Christ and Nicodemus. That's what it was all about. In John chapter 3, reading from verse 5, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say it to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. What is the end result? The end result is ability to obey God's commands, uh, which, which, is, which is a feature of the new covenant. So if, if we turn to Ezekiel and chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36, this is a, a, a major feature of the new covenant. Uh, reading from verse 25. Ezekiel 36, reading from verse 25, the Bible reads, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Notice the last part, 27 says, and I will put my spirit, the Holy Spirit, within you. He shall be within you. And what is he going to do within you? He will cause you, he will cause you, make you, as it were, to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. How about Jeremiah 31, still talking about the new, the coming of the new covenant? Jeremiah uh, 31, reading from verse 31. The Bible reads, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Verse 33, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. These are the terms and conditions of the New Testament. Now the spirit was going to operate from within the heart of the believer. The law was going to be written on the heart of the believer. The Holy Spirit was going to cause or to move God's children to obey the the law of God. What are the benefits or the elements of this victorious Christian life that the apostle is talking about in Romans chapter 8? Uh, verse 6 says, To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So the spirit brings life. We've already started to see in regeneration. But beyond that, the Holy Spirit brings forth and sustains life in the believer. He brings forth fruitfulness. Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is, against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. But the Holy Spirit also brings peace in the life of the believer. My brother Nico uh, dwelt, dwelt on that. I'll just say one or two things on the peace. The believer can expect peace 
the inner assurance that past sins are forgiven, that present events, no matter how painful, are being overruled for good, and that nothing that might occur in the future will be able to separate him from the love of God in Christ. Such peace means basic freedom from fear and restlessness. It implies contentment, sense of security, and inner tranquility. As Psalms 4 verse 8 says, In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. But the Holy Spirit also brings the ability now to please God, which was not there before. The ability to please God. Romans 8 verse 8 puts it negatively. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The positive is those who are in the spirit can, will please God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to live and to please God just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. Hebrews 13, 16. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Furthermore, the Apostle Paul shows us in Romans chapter 8 that there is no true Christianity apart from the indwelling Holy Spirit. Uh, Romans 8, 9 <clears throat> says, You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. It is not possible to be a child of God without the Holy Spirit being within us. And finally, the resurrection of the believer is guaranteed through and by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Dear brother, dear sister, if you're a believer today, you have a deposit a guarantee that you will rise again. Yes, you will die if Christ tarries, but you will rise again because the Holy Spirit dwells within you. Let us conclude by uh, uh, verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul is arguing that there, there are only two possible worlds. There are only two possible sides. Either you, are, you belong to the spirit uh, of the law of sin and death, you belong to the flesh, or you belong to the spirit. There are not two ways. There are not two worlds. In our driving around, we came across a billboard uh, for food, some eating place, but it was written, enjoy both worlds. Enjoying both worlds might be possible in the world of food, but in, in the Christian faith, it's either or. It's either we belong to the flesh or we belong to the spirit. And so, and so argues, goes, uh, the, the apostle Paul argues that to set the minds on the things of the flesh is to choose death. To set our mind on the things of the spirit is to choose life. The two are mutually ex exclusive. One cannot be both of the two. Our spiritual identity will be established by what we set our minds on. That will show who we are. And so allow me to conclude by reading uh, a few verses from Galatians chapter 5, which sum up the lesson in this portion of scripture. Galatians chapter five, reading from verse 16. But I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Jump to verse 24, the same, Galatians chapter 5. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh 
with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Amen.